I'm very happy to be here. My name is Tim, and uh, as Lucia said, I'm from uh, Okinawa Institute of Technology, uh, so, so known as OIST, uh, which is based in Okinawa, same island of Aruko and James Remer. And uh, yeah, today I will, uh, I want to, you know, my talk I think is a little bit different, uh, less ecological oriented, but more genomics or molecular oriented. But at the end of the talk, I hope that uh, I convince you how natural analogs together with uh, what Jason liked a lot, uh, manipulatory experiment in, in Aquaria uh, can be very powerful to understand how uh, marine life, in particular in my case, fish will adapt or if they adapt to uh, future climate. Um, so I like to start my talk to thanks people actually, because I tend to forget at the end. And all the work I will present here is mostly done by Celia Schuster, that now is in Hong Kong. She was my postdoc uh, before and Kang, um, also from Hong Kong University. Nothing will happen about uh, without the, field, the great field Monday, uh, which is start all this field of adaptation to ocean acidification and temperature. But also uh, thanks to my collaborator in Adelaide, Ivan and uh, Ricardo, which uh, we heard about him a lot here, which is, was very instrumental for uh, some of the work I show about Papua New Guinea. And also would like to thank my Icona Japan team, if you like to call it like this, like Sylvan, Ben, uh, James, Aruko, and uh, Kenyan Sensei. Uh, so these are the persons that actually did most of the work I will present today. But also, hmm? also would like to thank my team, uh, my lab, uh, in particular, uh, in terms of natural analog, Michael Izumiyama, my talented PhD student, you can see it here, is uh, leading the effort from my lab uh, about studying the Japanese, but also Burake in New Caledonia, uh, in terms of natural analog, to, with the help of Irina Kawai, Jeff Jolly, Billy Moore, and Yoko Shintani to, uh, you know, collecting samples and organize all these field trips. So these are our study site. We are very fortunate to have actually access to a lot of different uh, sites, not only CO2 SIP, volcanic uh, volcano, but also a uh, place like you can see here, um, Burake, the Ricardo site in New Caledonia. Uh, and um, for example, in French Polynesia, together with Vincent Laudet, Serge Plain, and David Lekini, Tayaro Atoll, and Palmyra Atoll. And that is an interesting site. It's not actually a future site, or, but I will, I don't have time to talk about this but, uh, today, but you know, if you want, you can ask me a question later. So what are the uh, sites? And I want to stress the point that uh, Aruko, Ricardo, uh, Ben just uh, say that comparing these sites and comparing how they change or how they, uh, they adapt uh, to the stream condition is actually very important. And that's the reason why I start to this exercise. Actually, to be honest, compared to, you know, all of you guys, I'm relatively new in the world of uh, uh, natural analogs, uh, but I will show you why I, I jump into this. See, these are our study site. You can see a different, not only volcanic seal to see, but we have uh, like Burake, semi close lagoon, which is not only, and, and test again, go back to the combined effort of uh, uh, high PCO2, low pH, high temperature, low oxygen. Uh, same thing for Tairato Atoll in French Polynesia, high salinity, high temperature, low oxygen. Palmyra, again, I told you, is a kind of different uh, because it's uh, the natural conservatory. It's probably the oldest uh, natural reserve in the world. Uh, we may consider, and as you know better than me, a lot to decide the problem to find the control. What is the baseline? What the reef was looking like 100 years ago, 200 years ago? Maybe Palmyra uh, can give us some answer to that. But again, I don't have time to go into that today. So now let me step back a second. Uh, again, because uh, most of my work has been done in, uh, in Aquaria, and I know that this has been controversial recently about how PCO2 or low pH can influence the uh, brain function of fish or other marine animals. Whatever you want to think, here are the evidence, that this is a paper we recently published in Nature, uh, where, you know, from different labs from around the world, there is several ecological, physiological, and molecular evidence that uh, low piece, uh, so high PCO2 can influence different aspects of the brain function from olfaction, lateralization, vision, boldness, and, and so forth. And uh, I will show you some of these uh, uh, data. 
Okay, so a uh, few years ago, uh, Phil and I, Celia, so we went to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and uh, randomly picked uh, in the Aaron Island, I believe, uh, several individual of this fish you can see on the left, which is a common uh, uh, denzel fish, and uh, performed some physiological tests or behavioral tests to see how the behave in high PC2. This is an aquarium, okay? So it's a manipulative experiment. So what you can see here, so if you take hundreds of fish, you can actually almost separate them on fish that are tolerant, meaning that even if you increase the PCO2, and that's increasing at the level of the end of the century prediction, uh, nothing happened, the behavior like control, or sensitive. So fish that actually, uh, they feel the effect of PCO2 and they become bold. So in the experiment we perform, uh, basically uh, they don't recognize uh, the Q. So furthermore, we also looked at, uh, we observed that this tolerance or sensitive is actually transmissible. So if you look on the left side here, if your father is actually tolerant in that uh, test we did, the the baby fish tend to be also tolerant. You can see the blue line in the nice correlation. And Alison from my lab also did a, a crossbreeding. So took female and male tolerant, non-tolerant crossbreeding in aquaria. And as you can see here, look at the blue dot. Is it, see, if your father is tolerant, it's likely that, uh, if that is the transcriptome data, it's likely that your, uh, the kids are also tolerant. So these are evident that this tolerance or sensitivity to high PCO2 is actually genetic and transmissible. So it's inconfutable. So uh, Celia, a few years ago, and that is published. So what he did is took some of these fish tolerant, non tolerant, uh, after phenotyping. So he removed the brain and he studied the brain transcriptome and uh, tried to understand why tolerant fish are tolerant and why sensitive fish are sensitive. So here what she found, to cut a long story short, she found incredibly that if you look those differential expressed genes that are only upregulated or differential regulated, no upregulated, in the tolerant fish in the presence of IPCO2, most of them, they map in the circadian rhythm clock. So the pathway that's controlled the day and night uh, rhythm. And why this is very important for coral reef fish is very important because if you can see here on the left, as you probably know, during the uh, night cycle, day and night cycle in the coral reef, the PCO2 or the CO2 contest, uh, the pH change a lot. Uh, during day and night. Why? Because of the sympadinium photosynthesis. During the night, the PCO2 go up because the coral need to breathe. And the, therefore the fish, they need, the coral reef fish, they need to change the acid-base regulation in order to be uh, breathe and, and survive. So that is all makes sense. And that's explained how tolerant fish are tolerant because basically they turn the clock in the night mode. Right? So they're very smart. They turn the night mode, even if it's during the day or even in aquaria, and they are tolerant to IPCO2. The, the sensitive fish, they are not able to do that for some reason. So um, another thing that we noticed, and that's other people show, uh, that uh, there is an interplay with the circadian and the GABA pathway. In fact, people show that, and I think Marco mentioned this, that if you, if you take the same fish, you put it in aquaria, and you add gabazine, which is a, a pharmacological inhibitor of the GABA receptor in the brain. Uh, so the fish, even the sensitive, they become taller. So basically blocking the GABA uh, pathway, somehow, we don't know exactly why, but somehow uh, reverse the effect of PCO2. So again, this uh, uh, corroborated with the circadian clock. So recently also we did another thing because of course, this is a manipulated experiment. We increased the PCO2 at a steady level, but what happened, as I told you before, in a real coral reef where the PC2 fluctuate, if you can see here on the left. So we repeat the similar experiment in two species of fish, the same denser fish and the clown fish percola, which is Nemo. And uh, what we basically, Catalan story show, what we saw that manipulating the day cycle of PCO2 actually somehow compensate the effect of high PCO2. So basically the fish, they react most when it's higher PCO2 in once, 
and when it's not fluctuating. And I will go back to this on the national analogs. So this shows that the effect of PCO2 on the brain uh, function or behavior of fish is actually can be modulated by the concentration of PCO2. So another evidence that that is true. So um, back to the experiment design, my postdoc Robert, when I was still in Saudi Arabia, so he took the same fish that Celia uh, tested for uh, tolerance and non-tolerance for the uh, transcriptomics uh, work, and he sequenced them around 300 fish, 150 tolerant, 150 not tolerant. He also assembled uh, at the genome of the, uh, the, the um, denzel fish. And you can see here on the right, the spiny denzel fish is the actually, that is like, if you're in the genomic uh, world, mine is bigger than yours, but I want to say this. This is the most complete fish uh, genome ever sequenced, even more complete than the zebra fish. But that is not important. It's important for me. Anyway, so, so what Roger found, so if sequence the genome of this fish, ask you the question, there is sign of selection or adaptation in the genome of the tolerant if you compare with the sensitive? And the answer is yes. He found three regions. You can see here, this, each of the dot is a SNP, so a, a, a point mutation in the genome. And there's three regions, and you can see here in the bottom, which are uh, where they map in the uh, genome, that's actually a very uh, highly mutated only in the uh, tolerant, but not in the sensitive fish. So you ask the question, what are the genes mapping there? One of the genes is this uh, dopamine receptor, which is also part of the GABA pathway, and uh, which are mutations that you can see here, this is the real uh, structure of the protein. I didn't do this work as a colleague of mine. So anyway, and, and apparently what they told me that this mutation in the tolerant fish can change uh, the, the conformation of the protein and uh, maybe change uh, the ability of the receptor to recognize the, uh, uh, the ligand. And also you can see on the bottom, this uh, gene is not only mutated, but it's also highly expressed in presence of ICO2. PCO2. Okay, so this is uh, evidence in laboratory, in manipulatory experiment, that in laboratory, okay, but also keep in mind that all the fish that we collected are actually from uh, the real world, so the GBR. So that there is a natural variation that's, uh, uh, at least for the fish population we study, the crown fish and the denser fish, that's allowed to uh, be sensitive or tolerant to high uh, PCO2. So now the next step at the time is okay. So these are the experiments, as uh, Jason said, undermine a little bit the uh, experiment in, in laboratory, which I totally get the point. Uh, so is this true also for the real world, let's say in natural analogs? And thanks to Ricardo and Katrina and uh, you know all uh, our friends, we were right a few years ago, we got access to the first CO2C on natural analog, which is the uh, UPA, UPA Zina Reef in Milne Bay. I don't talk about this, you already heard from Ricardo and Aruko and Jason and so forth. Here is the location. Uh, here is our look like, this is for Katrina picture. So here is the future. So what we call the future, so the seed. And again, the, I don't need to repeat that there is a dominated by coral that is massive varieties compared to the current day. So the, the current uh, reef that is more like a propora and branching coral and so forth. Beautiful site. So we went there. Uh, okay, so this is how it looked like. I skip it. So we went there with Ricardo, Phil, Celia, and uh, Ivan, and so forth. And uh, we collect uh, six species of fish, several individuals, 16 in total for each species, in the control and in the six sites. And including, if you, please, uh, if you see here on the top left uh, or right, whatever you see it, is the, uh, our model fish that we use in aquaria. Right, because it does exist in PNG and in the Great Barrier. So we took this and the this fish, and we removed the brain, and we repeat similar experiment that we did with the man in, in the aquaria. Right, so sequence the brain transcriptomics is again worked by uh, the analysis, beautiful analysis done by Kang and Celia in Hong Kong. So what are the results? Okay, these are very busy slides. It's actually not published yet. 
uh, this work and it's kind of new for me too. But to cut the long story short, don't look everything here. But if you look on the top right, one of the most of the differential express pathway in all the fish, including our uh, model fish, uh, a poly, is the uh, sorry, uh, is the circadian clock, right? So, and you can see here numbers, uh, the letter C, the circadian clock is differentially regulated also on those fish that they spend time. And these are fish that don't swim between sides, right? They stay normally uh, around the same uh, colony. So they're uh, very resident. So again, the same thing. So the circadian clock tend to be differentially regulated in the fish that are in, living in the sea compared to the control confirming the aquarium sphere. So we went for, but that is the beauty. So this is very cool. So when we were in Papua New Guinea, maybe Ricardo remember that, one of the day there was a storm, like a tropical storm, like a typhoon or something like that. So uh, we, were able, we were very brave and still go in the water and, and able to uh, collect fish. And uh, so some of these fish we collect actually, they are in an environment when the water was all mixed up by the storm. And if you look at the top, just to cut a long story short, that is only a poly, but it's through some other fish. If you see some of the genes that are, or the circadian clock and other, that are the differential express during the storm, when the waters mix, and then there is not so high uh, PCO2, the level of dispersion go down almost to the control side. And you can see up or down, left up and right down. And uh, some, uh, and furthermore, some of the genes they tend to, some of the fish they tend to overcompensate. It's like they are confused. So when there is this mix of water that they don't have anymore the IPCO2, they don't know what to do. And they upregulate the uh, GABA receptor, the move response, and, and so forth. So that's again is another strong evidence that there is a direct link between high PCO2 or lower pH and the behavior of the fish. Meaning that if you mix up the water because of a natural storm, the fish that are used to, to live in that uh, environment, they can go confused, at least on a molecular level. Uh, okay, so uh, we also look at the uh, level of uh, evolutionary rate of some of these genes. And uh, to our great surprise, so some of the genes in, uh, for example, Apolicanthus or the genes of the circadian clock uh, or ion transport uh, uh, tend to be look like they're evolving faster, right? Uh, than uh, other fish. And those are the fish that normally they respond higher to uh, high CO2. So uh, again, this is not definitive proof, but it's a strong proof that there is a very strong genetic basis, evolutionary basis, for the fact that the fish are able to adapt and survive in extreme environments like the CO2 in the CO2C in uh, New Caledonia. So uh, in conclusion, so uh, there is a strong species specific diversity uh, uh, or you know, reaction, response of different species of fish to uh, high PCO2 in the aquaria, but also in the natural analogs. Uh, we provide uh, for the first time uh, very strong genetic or genomic evidence or local adaptation to IPC2 in tropical fish community in aquaria and on the sides. And both aquaria based experiment and natural analogo show similar response of fish, at least molecular response to ocean identification. For example, the impairment of the GABA uh, pathway or the differential expression of the uh, circadian clock pathway. And um, so I, I hope that convince you that you know, combining laboratory experiment and natural analog, we can really provide proof of how fish, the or fish population of some species of fish, they may survive, or if not or not, in, in the future environment, uh, for example, ocean acidification. So I just want to conclude to say that this is an example of uh, PNG, Papua New Guinea. We did together with Sean, and Ivan and Phil and, and so forth. We did exactly the same experiment in uh, White Island in New Zealand, in Burake in, uh, in New Caledonia, in Iwo Toshima and uh, uh, Shikine together with Silvan and Ben and uh, Aruko uh, here in uh, Japan. And uh, we are in the process to analyze the data, but we use the same type of sampling and the same type of uh, 
technique, a genomic technique, because again, I want to stress the point that comparing the, the response of fish or any other organ you like uh, across different natural analog is the way to go. And I think that's the ICONA uh, network, uh, also the GOA network, the gen presented this morning, uh, are the way to go. So we need to really uh, put the effort to cover and standardize all our analysis, genetic, ecological, chemical, so forth, across all these sites. So um, I don't have a site in Ischia. I would love to come. I'm half Italian, half uh, Australian, so I may be uh, more privileged to, to be able to sample in Ischia, but please, the Ischia colleague, col col contact me because I would love to do some work there. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Last slides is who is paid for. This is paid by OIS, my own institution, it's very generous. The OIS Kicks is an internal grant that is cover some of our work in the world of Toshima and in Shikine with Silvan, Ben, and Michael, and James, and Aruko. Uh, as I told you, my lab is also part of the IRC Center of Excellence for Coral Study. I thanks them too. Of course, the Akona, which is a very big support, and the uh, Kekene, which is Japanese grant. Also, I would like to say that OIS is strongly support the, uh, the, uh, the SDG goal. And I think that my research or our research, all our research is actually fit perfectly in some of these goals. So thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions.